pre-show quid pro quo. Andre, you get one question. Go ahead. One question. Yeah. Oh, I have... And I have to answer it honestly. Right. Yeah. And and this is something I should have prepped beforehand, I suppose. I, yes. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> one would think. Um, I would have to say, in your experience, mm-hmm. how deeply do you think about death on a daily, daily basis? Uh, it enters into my mind, uh, I would say at least hourly. I think about death quite constantly. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A topic-based podcast for the curious about magic, the occult, the esoteric, and the like. My name is Douglas. I am joined by my guest, Andre, where we will discuss a topic picked by him. Today's topic is Discordianism. My initial reaction to you or picking this topic was uh, an interesting one. Before the uh, the recording of a program, I uh, I sent a email to all my future guests, basically with a list of about 20, 25, 30 topics. And uh, there's, there's just a ton of stuff in there, and you were allowed to pick one. And uh, that's what we get to talk about. I, I have no choice in what you pick. I just have the, the, the 30 topics or so that uh, you're allowed to go through. So I asked you uh, via text. Uh, what would you like to talk about? And you texted back Discordianism. And my initial feelings were somewhat strange. I wouldn't say it was frustration, but it was discontentment. Okay. <laughs> initial discontentment. Because I, I gave you a list and I went, Jesus, these are some good topics. And he picks one that I don't even know why I put it in there. It was like, oh, it's a topic that maybe somewhere further down on the line I can just like eat up an episode <laughs> and get it out of the way. It would just be filler, basically. But yeah, your 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 one little line I was like, Andre, what 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 topic did you want? Discordianism. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck. And I sat down on my chair and I thought about it. And I thought, no, this is actually the perfect first episode topic to go through because before I was a magician, before I was involved in the occult in any way, shape or form, I was a discordian. Mm. It's a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. When I told a friend that I was going to be covering discordianism, uh, he actually, this is an old friend that I have. He actually has me listed under his phone as Doug discordian Pope to this day. (laughs) So um, that just shows you that. deep. It definitely runs deep. So what is Discordianism? It is a parry religion, which is a religion disguised as a joke or a joke disguised as a religion. It had its heydays from the mid-60s to about the mid-70s. And Discordianism is the worship of Eris, the Greek god of discord or chaos. The Romans call her Discordia. The main tenet of, of, of Discordianism is that Chaos is the main operating principle of reality and the universe, not order, and we are stupid for thinking otherwise. The idea and comfort that one gets in submitting themselves to the day-to-day chaos that they see around them provides us a clarity or an enlightenment, and in a somewhat racist way, they describe it as uh, zen for round eyes, which... (laughs) Wow. Wow. This was coming from a time where, uh, you know, Mickey Rooney and in, in Breakfast at Tiffany's and, and uh, uh, casual racism was, you know, the order of the day, if you will. <laughs> Why Eris? So every religion, be it a joke or otherwise, needs a mythology or a story. So Christians, they have their mangers. They have the 40, uh, the 40 days in the desert. Uh, and 40 nights, which mathematically is impossible, but that's a story for another time. They have the crucifixion. Uh, Muslims have Gabriel pr- playing broken telephone with uh, Muhammad, and Scientology has uh, whatever they have. Um, the mythology of Discordianism is is called the original snub. What it is, is that Zeus at one point was throwing a party up on Mount Olympus, and he invited all of the gods except for one god, and that would be Eris. Because being the god of chaos, that's somebody you don't want to invite to, to your party. Eris, feeling, snub, uh, feeling snubbed, created a golden apple with the words Callisti written on it, which means to the prettiest. And she took this apple and she rolled it into the banquet hall. Now, attending the, the banquet itself were three goddesses. You have Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. They saw the apple 
said to the prettiest, and they had a discussion, well, this apple obviously belongs to me, and they could not agree. So they take the apple to Zeus, and Zeus says, the smart guy says, look, I've got enough women issues as it is. I'm staying out of this. So he fobs it off to Hermes, the trickster god, god of uh, travel and uh, and uh, communication. Hermes uh, takes the apple and he goes down to Mount Ida in, in Greece. And chilling on the mountain is a, uh, is a dude by the name of Paris. Paris is the son of the king of Troy. Th- Hermes says, look, uh, I've got three goddesses here. They're right behind me. We need you to decide who the prettiest is. And uh, each of the uh, three goddesses make a petition as to who the apple's going to belong to. So Hera basically says to Paris, look, Paris, I can make you a king. And Paris goes, I just have to wait a couple of years. My father's going to die. I can be king. Next, uh, we have Athena. Athena says, Paris, chill. I can make you skilled and wise. Paris goes, uh, I've just got to wait some more years. Wisdom comes with age. Skill comes with blah, 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 blah. Next. So Aphrodite, as she does, goes to Paris and basically says, look, Paris, I can give you the most beautiful girl in the world right now. And Paris, being a somewhat lusty young lad, says, bingo, winner, (laughs) number one with a bullet. Perfect. And so Aphrodite gives Paris, Helen, who is queen of Sparta, to Paris of Troy. Helen, of course, becomes Helen of Troy. And the first war, according to the Greeks, between men occurs, which is the Trojan War, and that's uh, that's how apparently how chaos entered into uh, the world. Uh, just like every religion, uh, uh, it needs a document to get the message out. Uh, in Christianity, you have the Bible. In Islam, you have the Quran, and in Scientology, you have John Travolta's Battlefield Earth. Um, <laughs> and the the document that. Uh, that Discordians have is called the Principia Discordia, which I have right here. It's funny. It's definitely of its era. If uh, if you want to have a quick flip through that, it it's definitely uh, mid '60s to mid '70s. It comes from a time, you know, with uh, Ken Casey and the Merry Pranksters. You have Abby Hoffman. Uh, you have got Timothy Leary. A lot of drugs around. Everybody's having a really good time. You've got Paul Krasner and the Realist and the Yippies. Anyways, it just it's 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 got interesting images in it. It's got a lot of slogans. It's it's a strange, funny document. If you really want, you can download it from the internet. Uh, they're available for copies for free. Personally, I like it well enough, but after a while, uh, you say, "Okay, I get it. I get it." It kind of beats you over the head with the whole parody joke religion thing. It's it's. It, it, it gets tiresome. It, it's a joke that kind of keeps telling itself over and over again, and, it's, and it doesn't really quite involve. But there is some interesting stuff in there. So um, you'll be flipping through it, and it'll be like, oh, yeah, five tons of flax, or uh, uh, King Kong died for your sins, blah, 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 uh, hot dogs on Fridays, etc. And then you get to page 49. And page 49 kind of gives you the main uh, principle of of Discordianism, as well as how it reflects to reality. And I'm going to actually read you. It's about a page and a half, a little bit here, but uh, here, here goes some Discordian metaphysics. The aneuristic principle is that of apparent order. The eristic principle is that of apparent disorder. Both order and disorder are man-made concepts and are artificial divisions of pure chaos, which is a level deeper than is the level of distinction making. With our concept-making apparatus called mind, we look at reality through the ideas about reality, which our culture gives us. The ideas about reality are forever perplexed by the fact that other people, especially other cultures, see reality differently. It is only the ideas about reality which differ. Real, capital T, true, reality is a level deeper than is the level of concept. We look at the world through windows on which we have been drawn grids, concepts. Different philosophies use different grids. A culture is a group of people with rather similar grids. Through a window, we view chaos and relate it to the points on our grid, and thereby understand it. The order is in the grid. That is the aneuristic principle. 
Western philosophy is traditionally concerned with contrasting one grid with another grid and amending grids in hopes of finding a perfect one that will account for all reality and will, hence, say unenlightened Westerners, be true. This is illusory. It is what we Arisians call the aneuristic illusion. Some grids can be more useful than others, some more beautiful than others, some more pleasant than others, etc. But none can be more true than any other. Disorder is simply unrelated information viewed through some particular grid. But, like relation, no relation is a concept. Male, like female, is an idea about sex. To say that maleness is absent of femaleness, or vice versa, is a matter of definition and metaphysically arbitrary. The artificial concept of no relation is the heuristic principle. The belief that order is true and disorder is false, or somehow wrong, is the aneuristic illusion. To say the same of disorder is the heuristic illusion. The point is that little t, truth, is a matter of definition relative to the grid one is using at the moment, and that capital T, truth, metaphysical reality, is irrelevant to the grids entirely. Pick a grid, and through it some chaos appears ordered and some appears disordered. Pick another grid, and the same choice will appear differently ordered and disordered. Reality is the original Rorschach. So, basically just saying that society's reality tunnels are uh, arbitrary and uh, and that uh, yeah chaos is uh, is the order of the day let's let's actually go into the uh, the uh, the history of it uh, if you want to learn about discordianism it's pretty much most of it is in uh, is in the principia discordia but the story of the creation of discordianism is a tale of three men all right so the first his name is greg hill or known as Malaclips the Younger. He is the, well, the main author of the uh, Principia Discordia. He was, uh, uh, what's strange is that not much is known about him. He was born in 41. He worked as a computer programmer at the Bank of America. He later made some of the very first video games, and then he stopped doing that and went back to the Bank of America. He dies in uh, 2000, and that's basically almost all we know about him. He's, he's a somewhat quiet figure, but he was childhood friends with one Carrie Thornley. Carrie Thornley, Carrie Wendell Thornley, is certainly the most interesting, not the most important figure in Discordianism. Carrie Thornley was born in 1938. He attended high school with, uh, with Greg Hill. They formed the Discordian Society after coming up with the idea of Discordianism at a bowling alley in, uh, in L.A. in the early 60s. After high school, Carrie Thornley joins the Marine Corps. Uh, he's discharged uh, from the Marines uh, a year and a bit later. While a part of the Marines, he worked as a radio operator. He moves to New Orleans uh, with Greg. Uh, while in New Orleans, he finishes but does not publish a book called The Idle Warriors. He moves uh, back to California, finishes a a book, another book. He finds himself with his with his uh, the crazy people in California to start doing a lot of drugs, uh, Timothy Leary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Discordianism, psychedelics. Uh, Discordianism eventually starts to grow, and um, later on in life, he he kind of roams the country as a hitchhiker. Later in life, he works for various magazines in either Florida or uh, Atlanta. Uh, he dies in 1998, and that is his life in a nutshell. Uh -huh. And I use the word nutshell appropriately and with purpose because Carrie Thornley's life is fucking nuts. I want to try and get it into everybody's head here of, uh, of, of the idea of a prankster. Pranksters constantly work with what is real, what isn't, what is reality, what is fake. Uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, that is their bread and butter now. Um, unfortunately for his, uh, for his sake, it all comes back and bites him in the ass. Uh, he becomes a victim of all of the strange things that he puts out into the world. Now I mentioned two books that he wrote, Idle Warriors and the, uh, not title mentioned second book. The reason I didn't mention the title at the time is because both books deal with the same subject matter. And that is Lee Harvey Oswald and if you don't know who that is, he is the gentleman who is credited with killing John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. Now, many people have written books about Lee Harvey Oswald. Carey himself had a very unique perspective. He was friends with Lee Harvey Oswald. They were in the Marine Corps together, uh, and their lives are intrinsically linked. Idle Warriors, the book itself, is a 
book about Carrie's experience in the Marine Corps, but specifically about Lee Harvey Oswald and what would make a person defect to Russia in the middle of the Cold War. It's a story of a Marxist Marine moves to Moscow. It's a bit mind-blowing because he wrote it in 61 in New Orleans, two years before Oswald became a household name. Now, this was particularly attractive and definitely caught the attention of some people, namely the uh, Warren Commission, which was a group that had to get together to try and come up with the, the story of how President Kennedy was killed. Of course, a, a book written about Oswald and Oswald's experiences before the yeah. Kennedy kills is going to draw a bit of right. attention. So Kerry is ordered to, to testify before the Warren Commission. He does so. He just basically just, uh, has the whole, you know, he was a loner. He was, he was, he was a Marxist. He was a nut. And he mo- probably most definitely shot Kennedy uh, himself. Nothing else involved. It goes on with his life. In a couple of years, he actually decides to, uh, it's actually about a year after, he decides to write a book about Oswald, the cash in on the whole Oswald crate. Everybody was writing a book about Lee Harvey Oswald at this point. So, uh, so he does. Uh, and in the book, he basically tells the, the same line with the lone gunman theory, as does the, uh, the book, The Idle Warriors. Both books get published, uh, obviously. And yeah, they make, uh, they make a little bit of money. He's back in LA and again, Discordianism starts going well. Uh, it's, it's a bit popular. Everything is fine with him. He moves to Florida in, in 1967. And here's where the part of the story where we enter the jolly green giant uh, by the name of Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison would be known to most people as the main character in Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. He's played by Kevin Costner. Uh, he is the district attorney of, of New Orleans. In, in the late 60s, he takes a look at the, the Warren Commission, or, uh, sorry, the Warren Commission, and says, like, this doesn't fit. Something, in his words, this dog don't hunt. And so he launches the Kennedy assassination investigation. He wants it to be the first domino to start the fall in the investigation as to what really happened during the Kennedy assassination and that uh, he does not believe that Lee Harvey Oswald is the only person to kill John F. Kennedy. Now, in 1968, Kerry is served with a subpoena by Jim Garrison to testify. Garrison is absolutely positive that uh, that Kerry is involved uh, somehow, especially uh, with his time in New Orleans. While... Both uh, both of them served in obviously served in the military together. Uh, they they knew each other, and again, they uh, Oswald lived in New Orleans, and uh, Carrie uh, Carrie Thornley lived in New Orleans. So there's just way too many com- uh, coincidences for for Garrison, and he thinks that he's got a winner. They they get him there, and he he gives his testimony. He says that while he was in New Orleans. He, him and Oswald didn't he didn't even know Oswald was there they had nothing to do with each other etc and and Garrison says this is bullshit he says Carrie I know for a fact they had a P.O. box not too far away from Oswald what are you guys doing with P.O. box because you have houses here Garrison's like you guys are getting money from the CIA there's definitely something involved here Carrie says no absolutely not there's 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 definitely nothing happening here uh, happening here what's also interesting is that uh, Garrison he's positive that Carrie Thornley was what's called one of the fake Oswalds. Do you know what they are? The fake Oswalds? Do you you remember the movie? So fake Oswalds were guys that would go around basically sticking out in New Orleans, sticking out like a, a, a sore trigger finger, if you will. They would go to like shooting ranges and say to the people next door, it's like, oh, I wish that target was the president. My name's Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> or they would go to like parties and they would talk uh, like, well, that that Kennedy bastard, he's 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 doing crazy things in, in Cuba. Um, Before this assassination? Correct. Correct. And what period of time were these guys active? So they, they were basically active months before Kennedy was killed. And who can corroborate this? Who, just people around the time that, that Jim Garrison went around. He was like, all these people have these guys that are, are basically saying that they're Oswald. There's even pictures of them on like that you can find online of people that don't look anything like Oswald. But they'll be at a bank basically saying, I can't put money in this bank. This President Kennedy's turned this 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 country into a shithole. And they have pictures of it. It's like, it doesn't look anything like 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 Oswald, but they why are they using the name Lee Harvey Oswald? This happens in both Dallas and New Orleans. <laughs> What's crazy about this is that Kerry Thornley, if you look up pictures of him uh, online, you usually get the same picture. He's kind of got this strange bowl cut and like a Abe Lincoln beard. But when he was living in New Orleans, he cut his hair short and he shaved his beard 
and he looks exactly like Lee Harvey Oswald. And again, while Kerry uh, was in New Orleans, he said, no, I never even saw Oswald. There are witnesses that say this is bullshit. Kerry was definitely doing things with Lee Harvey Oswald. And so uh, eventually what happens is is that uh, Kerry gives his testimony. He walks away. He's, he's back to Florida. He's like, well, I'm done with it. It's all good. And wrong. He is served with a perjury charge by Garrison, who is very positive that he is lying under oath. This this sticks. And until about 1969, when the uh, Garrison investigation collapses, uh, the person they were trying to prosecute, his name was Clay Shaw, is found not guilty. The first domino to lead to the actual investigation of the Kennedy assassination. It just never falls. And all uh, perjury charges are dropped against Kerry Thorne. Lee Army Oswald... Does he, does Lee Harvey Oswald talk about his friend at all? Carrie Thornley? Yeah. Apparently he did, yeah, to people, yeah. yeah. But not during, not when he was arrested. No, no. at no point. The, the 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 period of time from when he was arrested to when he was killed by Jack Ruby is very short. Sure. The only thing that he was saying is that he was a patsy and, uh, like, there's these people that are involved. He doesn't not mention Carrie uh, uh, Thornley in any way, shape, or form. He 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 kept his mouth shut pretty uh, pretty good. Perjury charges get dropped in 1970. Kerry Thornley thinks he's in the clear. Well, not really. Kerry separates from his wife, and then the next nine years are extremely rough for Kerry Thornley. He starts to remember things, specifically things about the Marines, New Orleans, and uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, this is way too much detail to go into because it would take hours, but there's a book written by Adam Golrightly called uh, The Prankster and the Conspiracy. It's a great book. Uh, it's it's It actually blew my mind uh, quite a bit, and I would suggest it, if this is your bread and butter, to definitely check it out. It'll be a link to in the show notes. But he, he, he starts to, after this, he starts to go back and remember everything about uh, his time with, with uh, Lee Harvey. And Carrie Thornley goes from being a... Uh, Lone gunman, Marxist kills John F. Kennedy, uh, and there, there was, there's nobody else that's just the lone gunman to, huh, maybe there might be a conspiracy involved, who knows, to Holy Iris, there's definitely a conspiracy, and I am definitely involved in some way, and I'm starting to remember it, so. Drug addict? Not drug addict. Who, Kerry Thornley? Yeah. Uh, in and out. Uh, but as far as like hard drugs like heroin and whatnot, oh, not so LSD. LSD, that yeah, time. Yeah, okay. correct. Yeah, probably a ton of pot. Okay. Yeah, and throughout his life, basically, he was he was lifelong. Um, that to this day, Paul McCartney's a lifelong pot smoker. So, um, Beatles suck. Well, there we go. <laughs> I've lost half of my <laughs> three fans <laughs> in the first episode. Andre. <laughs> Perfect. So, again, Carrie's starting to remember things. There, there might be something to this. So. While in uh, the Marines, working as a radio operator, Kerry Thornley was at Atsugi Air Force Base in Japan. Uh, he served there. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald served there, uh, not at the same time. But this was an interesting Army base. It was part of the same program uh, called Operation Derby Hat, which was... One of the two army bases at the time that were doing experiment uh, experimentation with uh, LSD at the time uh, on soldiers and brainwashing. It's it's kind of the uh, the MK Ultra, which everybody's heard of, uh, MK Naomi, this kind of thing. In fact, it was while on a ship heading back to America from Japan that Kerry Thornley found out about Lee Harvey Oswald defecting to Russia, which inspired him to write his first book, uh, The Idle Warriors. Somebody else who served time at Atsugi Air Force Base was E. Howard Hunt, who was everybody's favorite boogeyman. He's more uh, known as the uh, one of the plumbers for uh, for the Watergate scandal, which basically ended the uh, Nick- Nixon administration. Everything about this man stinks to high heaven. Uh, his son, uh, St. John, is, is positive uh, that his father was a part of killing Kennedy and said so uh, on his deathbed, a deathbed which uh, had jars of his urine underneath it. Anyways, that's always, always good. Um, always a sign of, of somebody without something to hide. <laughs> Sound mind. Sound mind, absolutely. 
You dump it. You always dump it. You always dump it. Um, so uh, Kerry also remembers his time in New Orleans uh, about two men uh, that used to say some pretty suspicious things about Kennedy and Castro and the mafia and Cuba uh, just out of nowhere. One of them was a guy named Slim, who Kerry Thornley was positive was involved in anti-Castro militias. And the other was named by Kerry as brother-in-law, whose name uh, at the time went by as, as Gary uh, Kirstein. Now, Kerry is absolutely convinced uh, that this period of time that these two guys were definitely involved in blowing Kennedy's head off and that Kirsten himself was E. Howard Hunt. There was a party that they were at and uh, Kirstein went up to to Kerry Thornley and uh, basically said, like, uh, Kerry, if you had to kill the the, uh, the president, how would you do it? And, and Kerry says, like, well, I don't know, like, it's whatever. And then without even getting response, uh, Kirsten's like, well, here's how I'd do it. I'd have all these departments and all these different levels and all of this, uh, too many hands in, 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 in operating this thing that, so when it actually finally goes down, they're not able to point the finger at anybody. And, uh, Carrie Thornley goes, yeah, um, I'm going to go and try the artichoke dip. <laughs> like, uh, but he's, he, he just starts to completely remember and he starts to, he, he, he actually drives himself in, 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 insane. He's, 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 he becomes positive that he was brainwashed in his time in, in Japan and while in the Marines and that, uh, that he was doing CIA related work while he was in, in New Orleans. If he was one of the, the other Oswalds. He, he 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 brings up Manchurian uh, candidate style assassination. Uh, uh, sorry, assassins that that uh, can be controlled through radio waves. He actually believed that radio waves could be beamed into the people's brains to make them do things that they would never remember. And uh, his his friends all became CIA uh, controllers. That all had a had a uh, had a uh, they were complicit in 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 the assassination of JFK and, and basically to drive Kerry Thornley insane. Again, a guy playing with the ideas of what's real and what's fake. He, he started to uh, get his, a taste of his own medicine, really, uh, unfortunately. Paranoia level 10 was reached. This is the, and after this, this is the period of time where he starts hitchhiking and starts just getting out. I mean, he's, he's basically ostracized and pushed everybody that was close to him uh, out of his life. And uh, one of these friends that uh, Kerry suspects is controlling him, uh, he treats so bad that it might be uh, a reason that he moved to Ireland for a little while. For a time, this person talks about uh, how he thought that Kerry Thornley was going to be um, you know, jumping uh, out from a bush to try and kill him. This is, uh, he was a former editor of, of Playboy magazine and the, the third man in our story, the most important individual in Discordianism, a man by the name of Robert Anton Wilson. Now, he's not necessarily one of the creators of Discordianism, but he is certainly the most influential and therefore the most important, Pope Bob Wilson. Uh, he's going to get his own episode because he deserves one. Yeah, he's one of the most important uh, self-titled ontological gorillas of the 20th, the 21st, and probably, hopefully, every century hereafter. Now, how Robert Anton Wilson becomes Pope Bob is 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 very easy. Uh, he was uh, he was acquainted with Carrie Thornley uh, when Carrie was in in California. Uh, while working for as an editor for Playboy, and Playboy had many editors. This was back in the heyday when it was a it was a people would actually buy magazines. Uh, they would get letters uh, from people just with a ton of conspiracy theories in them, and they were all extremely wild. Not just about JFK, but just about absolutely everything. And he would collect these, and they, they he would read them to a friend of his by the name of Robert Shea. And they're like, this is good stuff. Like this is, this is, these are good stories. This is good fiction. Like this, there's something here. So they decide to create a story around all of these conspiracy theories and they make the antagonists of this story, the Illuminati. Every great story, every great uh, group of villain needs an up to the task group of, of heroes and Going back to uh, to to Carrie Thorley and 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 uh, Greg Hill, they make the protagonists of the book that they're about to write the Discordians. The book itself is called the Illuminatus Trilogy. And wait, they choose they make this up? Correct. In from like from Playboy. So Playboy would receive a ton of letters right. from people from the public. Right. 
And it would just be about whatever. If something was going around at the time. <laughs> Who knows what? But the Illuminati at this point was already existed, quote unquote. Well, right? the, Illum- the Bavarian Illuminati was founded by Adam Weishaupt. And they just needed a, like, we need a bad guy. Like, so some- up at this point, mm-hmm. it, it was well known that Illuminati existed to some, or... At, it, what, it, historically, it existed, but the, the blanket term Illuminati was just like any group that we can say wants to control the Is this the, the first time contemporary-wise that... This is brought up, Illuminati? Kind like, of, yeah. Like, the, the idea of the Illuminati itself was kind of like, it was a historical thing that people remembered. But it was Robert Anton Wilson and Bob Shea that really pushed the Illuminati into the public sphere. And it was through a work of fiction. Like, it, it was, it's a funny book. Like, it's not, uh, uh, the Illuminati are not as, like, they're trying to pre- pre- be portrayed as being sinister. They're actually quite incompetent at what they do. Uh, and the people that fight them are these Discordians. Uh, in fact, the book itself is dedicated to Carrie Thornley and Greg Hill. If you look through it, you can even get your own Pope card in there. It's Discordian Pope card. You can cut it up, put it in your wallet. I had one for several years. Did he name himself Pope? Pope Bob? Yeah. Probably. I mean, if just can I can I level with you? Right now, Andre, you're a Pope. Oh, I see. Yeah, you're a Pope now. Okay. Right, so you're infallible in your beliefs, and uh, oh, great! And nobody can take your shit. Oh, perfect! In fact, everybody listening to this episode yeah. is now a pope. Oh, look at that! And uh, up to the uh, the doctrine of of discordianisms, we must stick apart. The Illuminus trilogy was a series of three books uh, that, in their time, were enormously influential. It's lightning in a bottle. Again, something was in the water that time. Something was in the air. And uh, if you have, if you're my age and you have a weird uncle who reads a lot of science fiction books, chances are. He has probably read the uh, the Illuminas trilogy. Again, not unlike the uh, Principia Discordia, it is a definite product of its time. It's it's somewhat hard to read today. There's tons of sex, uh, like just gratuitous amounts of sex, childish humor, stuff that would have been like really popular when it was written in the uh, uh, or published in the uh, the early seventies. It's not my cup of tea. Uh, for fledging, uh, fledgling magicians uh, wanting good fiction, the sequel to the book, Masks of the Illuminati, is a much, much superior book. Take my word for it. The, the three main characters of the book is James Joyce, Carl Jung, and Albert Einstein. Anyways, the Illuminati is, is, is it's interesting to read, but uh, it's, it's a huge book, and uh, you can use your time reading better things. But we can't, we can't uh, stress enough just how big of a book it was at its time. A lot of people's writing careers and their spiritual uh, esoteric careers are owed to the Illuminatus and to uh, Robert Anton Wilson's biography called Cosmic Trigger. What this book does is introduce a, another concept into Discordianism, which is very, very at kind of the, the, the core of it as well, is, is uh, conspiracy, uh, conspiracy itself. And... <sighs> Discordians aren't your garden variety conspiracy nut. And I'm going to introduce the the, uh, the concept of what kind of conspiracy people that you have. There's tons of them, but I would say the uh, what I was talking about earlier, the, uh, the aneuristic illusion, people that like conspiracy in an aneuristic fashion are guys like Alex Jones and later Kerry Thornley, people that that think that there's an order to these conspiracies, that it's, it's, it's an all-encompassing, really negative view of humanity, that there's a group of people trying to take over the world and that they want to, they want to, uh, they want to, the downfall of man, everyone, one of us wants to go into prison. And then there's the heuristic uh, conspiracy uh, um, fans, people like Robert Anton Wilson, who, who, who say that conspiracies exist, no doubt, um, but they're, they're usually odd and actually quite funny. Some are terrifying, absolutely. But yes, there's this silly side to them. A, a, a good example of it would be in 1966, the uh, CIA uh, had, a, uh, had a thing where they put biological agents into light bulbs and they went into the New York subway and through them shattering, uh, spreading billions of these germs around the New York subway and basically infecting a large portion of New York. And nobody died that we know of, but these were all unwilling participants in this study to see how quickly these things could spread. Um, but you can just see them walking around with light bulbs in their pockets. But again, the the heuristic illusion is that, you know, most of these conspiracies, they, they fall apart due to the, the human element, the human pettiness and, uh, and, and mendacity. You can see them, conspiracies, as either being sinister and ordered or stupid and uh, uh, discordant. T- to wrap up, discordianism is, is, is quite an interesting thing. I, th- I think 
if the uh, Principia Discordia, sorry, the Principia Discordia seems a bit too silly and not quite uh, eloquent enough for you, I, I'd say go to the writings of Robert Anton Wilson, specifically his book Cosmic Trigger One, um, The Final Secret of the Illuminati. It was a huge influence on chaos magicians. In fact, chaos magicians for a while there, uh, they kind of, Discordianism and them went hand in hand. That influence kind of ebbs and flows. That's a that's a topic for another time. Chaos magicians are trying to take themselves a bit more seriously, and there's nothing wrong with that. Discordianism itself kind of goes in waves. I see it as a bit of a positive force um, in, in magic, if only for its initial gusto of playing with belief and uh, and general agnosticism. They, they they have katmas discordianism katmas are, uh, are are kind of meta beliefs dogmas are absolute beliefs discordians have katmas and such things as uh, if you know that all affirmations are true in some sense false in some sense and meaningless in some sense true and false in some sense true and meaningless in some sense and false and meaningless in some sense and true and false and meaningless in some sense then the world will start to be a bit more clearer to you in some sense. So <laughs> they have other, uh, cat that makes sense. Yeah. Cat, cat mas that are, um, convictions create convicts. You were a prisoner to your belief. And, uh, there's one is the thought of a unicorn, an actual real thought. There's a little bit of Parmenides in there, but I'll, I'll, Parmenides deserves his own episode as well. Interesting characters are bound in, in Discordianism. Another Pope is Emperor uh, Norton, who was a real life 19th century eccentric who found himself in San Francisco and made himself uh, Emperor of the United States. He would eat at restaurants for free. He created his own money, money which is worth um, thousands of dollars now. When he uh, died uh, on the street penniless to his name, 10,000 San Franciscans attended his funeral procession on the streets. Uh, interesting stuff. The Discordians are kind of like the precursor to uh, the 80s and 90s Church of Subgenius. More recent examples would be um, the Flying Spaghetti Monster and uh, Pastafarianism. It's just basically poking fun at uh, monoculture as well as, as religion itself. Discordianism probably only lives on, as most joke religions do, as, a, as a, like a curiosity. The the initial adolescent impulse to say that all organized religion is bullshit, I think is important. If you're if you're if you're ten to fourteen years old, this is cool stuff. As adults, we've kind of all come to this conclusion it's already. Like reading Charles Bukowski. Correct. If you've read one Charles <laughs> Bukowski book, you've yeah, read twenty every, is amazing. At <laughs> forty, it's like correct. Okay, no. Yes, exactly. For me personally, Discordianism is. Um, it's helped me quite a bit. It's not a religion to me. It's more of a. Or, or even like an axiom or a worldview, it's more of a, a state of mind. I see a lot of people somewhat discouraged and pessimistic about the, the state of humanity in the world at this moment. Uh, I see it affecting people and they're generally just frustrated with the, the inherent stupidity of other people and groups of people, something as specific as politics and specific politicians or just humanity as a whole. Um, they can't handle how dumb and how wrong everything is. They feel that they can't escape from it. And uh, cynicism is, is like, is inevitable. But uh, I think it's, it's because we're tricked into believing that there should be some order to everything. We see a universe that's, that's supposedly inherently ordered when unfortunately it's not. Th this chaos uh, that we, we, we have around us, we're trying to constantly fix. Uh, for me, I see things uh, uh, such as the chaos and stupidity not as, like, as, as a serious thing. It does not need to be fixed. It's, it's a joke. It's silly. I'm amused by it. And it's not even a very good joke. I, I don't get discouraged like most people do, I, I find, when, when things happen in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that I don't take things seriously, but but that this all encompassing order is is not the the thing that we should be striving for we we shouldn't be constantly trying to fix things that's not the way that's seemingly not the way that the universe works right now and and our attempts to try and fix it makes it worse so again discordian is a bit of a a, um, a state of mind for me it's it's, I find it comforting. To put it another way, another Katma is that uh, the enlightened mind takes things lightly. Or my personal favorite is uh, life is far too important a thing to take seriously. So 
in short, that is the episode. And Andre, I want to I want to give you something. I don't want to give you something, but uh, <laughs> here I have a golden apple. Right. And I would like you says uh, Calisti on it. I would like you to open it. Okay, good. And see what's inside. All right. I'm opening it now. No. It says, you are. Yeah. Mm, I, I agree. Yes. I am. Perfect. Thank you. Thank no, you for... No problem, buddy. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Um, so where are we at with Discordianism to this day? Where are we at to Discordianism to this day? Um, Is it, it now it, just it, off to the dustbins of the 99 cents? No, uh, the it, it, book? It, it exists online, basically. Uh, there's a great website called uh, Historica Discordia, and it kind of goes into the bit more of the history. There's some interesting articles. The gentleman who wrote the prankster and the conspiracy, he's the, uh, the gentleman who has been compiling all of this information about Discordianism itself. But, I mean, it's, it's not evolving as far as the Principia Discordia is concerned. It's, you know, people just playing around with it, saying that they're Discordians. In fact, to this day, when I have a, uh, like I have to do an online survey or something of the like, uh, sometimes they ask what your religion is and, you know, it'll be the religions, click, 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 and then I'll click other and it'll come up and then I just put down Discordian because it's the easiest one for me. Um, and that's why they're tapping your phones. And that's why that's why they're <laughs> tapping exactly. But uh, no, as far it's not it's 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 not dead. It's very much alive and it will continue to be alive until it just uh, becomes uh, an, another forgotten thing, a curiosity as as it exists. So um, yeah. Very good. Uh, so I hope everybody enjoys being a pope. Uh, don't forget that that uh, that you are a pope and 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 carry that with you. Is there uh, money in this? Is there money involved in this? No. Well, you can do what Edward Norton did and create your own money oh, because it's probably as worth as much as, as everybody else's money. It's just the idea that we we think the idea behind right. money is right. right. So that's that's the kind of things that the discordianism tries to play with. Everything's a joke, basically. So uh, that's all for this week. Don't miss future episodes, which will be uh, uh, which can be grabbed from iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and more. And, uh, head to whatmagicisthis.com for show notes, book suggestions, and other uh, relevant details. Uh, on the website, head to the menu to find my Facebook and Twitter accounts. And to end the episode, we have the post-show quid pro quo. Andre, mm. if you had to put your money into one conspiracy theory, not a popular one like the JFK assassination, but one you truly believe in your heart that you could spread to the world to enlighten them as to something you think is so obviously conspiracy, which one would that be? Oh, the AIDS virus mm -hmm. was concocted yeah. by the Reagan government. The, the Reagan government came up with the AIDS Came virus. up and they, it just totally took off in a way that they did not expect. Really? I find it to be a little too... Too curious the fact that how quickly it spread, right. even though they know that it existed in some form or another mm -hmm. throughout Africa. Mm -hmm. And then it just, New York City, Los Angeles, so fast, mm -hmm. so quick, killing a lot of men. Right. It's just, it's just a weird coincidence. That's all. If uh, listeners, if you want to get into more details of this, uh, Robert Anton Wilson actually, uh, about uh, 10 years before he passed, or no, less than that, five years before he passed away, created a book called uh, Everything is Under Control. And basically, a third of that book is about this very thing that Andre is talking about. So that'll also be in the show notes. Andre, thank you so much for joining me My today. My pleasure. And uh, we'll definitely talk again soon. I hope so. All right. And uh, talk to you later. <laughs>